Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Total Seminars Discord study hall. My name is Steve Nicholson. Tonight, we're going to be exploring Security Plus, but an often overlooked objective, actually two new objectives now in the Security Plus, which is Open Source Intelligence, or OSINT. Now, it might, you know, sounds kind of a fancy term, and, you know, well, it is, but if you've ever been, let's say, driving down the road, like most people probably don't drive that way these days, if you've ever been driving down the road, and you've been, you know, you saw like a restaurant, like, ooh, Steve's Seafood Shack. That looks interesting. And you get home, and you pull up your phone, you jump on Yelp, and you're like, oh, here it is. Here I found Steve's Seafood Shack. Uh, a delightful and delicious dining experience, says Betty from Seaport. The best paella in the state, says Miguel from Tampa. Awesome. Well, I think I'm going to go there for dinner tonight. If you've ever done something like that, if you've gone out on the web and searched for publicly available information to help either, you know, make come to a decision about a person, place, or thing, or do more research on a company or service, uh, then you've performed what's known as open source intelligence. And tonight, what we're going to kind of talk about is there's a need uh, for open source intelligence in any security structure within an organization, not only just so you can kind of keep an eye on possible adversaries or what's out there about your company, but, you know, a really good security posture from a company includes a company that can take a look at all their entire digital footprint, their company's social media, their social media, all the stuff that the all-encompassing public information that's out there available for people and help determine that there's no, you know, possibly identifiable information, uh, you know, anything that violates any laws, anything that could lead to any sort of uh, breaches or attacks. And um, when you do this, you have to be careful because a lot of us have, you know, some of these social media uh, accounts already, right? And you never want to mix personal and business because in the early days of social media, it was actually quite funny. A lot of um, law enforcement people were actually uh, causing problems in cases because they would use, be logged into their personal profile and go research somebody on Facebook or, you know, whatever was around before then, the Instagram, if that's still popular, Pinterest, all these places. And those those social media systems are so good at picking up, you know, uh, social signals that they started recommending these officers and these special task forms, uh, special task force, uh, excuse me, uh, personnel to these uh, criminals. And they ended up, you know, getting a win that they were being investigated. So not only do you want to do it to protect the investigation if you're involved in blue team activities, but you can also take some of these uh, techniques and, you know, protect yourself, have a less, a, a smaller digital footprint for yourself or your company. And um, when we talk about open source intelligence, we're kind of, let me go over here to the objectives of the CompTIA Security Plus, the latest one. And if we, we'll do this smart, we'll just search for OSINT and we look at it, it pops up first in 1.5. So it pops up right at the beginning and it's talking more about threat intelligence sources, where to go to look for those, um, you know, threat models, you know, all, all the, there should be a bunch of stuff on kill chain and things in here as well, somewhere in this section. Um, but where to go to find all those publicly facing information sources. And when I say publicly facing or open source, we're basically talking about things that are available without paying, I guess is a good way to look at it, right? So all these social medias that are out there nowadays are all available without paying, uh, a lot of information tracking sites, things like that. And, um, you know, they're all excellent sources of information, especially if you can really drill down into either your persona, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, or, you know, your target's persona, um, you know, there's all, uh, typically a wealth of information there. So we see it here in threat intelligence sources first. Uh, and then we also see it down here, I believe in 1.8. Yeah, passive and active reconnaissance. So it's a critical part of, again, there's a lot of interchangeable terms in information technologies these days and cybersecurity information security is no different. Um, but in penetration testing, they call the first step uh, typically either reconnaissance, uh, the first step in the pen testing process, either reconnaissance, or they might call it pretexting, a um, couple different names, but basically it is, you know, one of the components of that is assert, uh, ascertaining, excuse me, what information of your target is out there that you can get from these publicly available social signals or corporation data or, you know, whatever's out there that's on the web. There is a ton, a ton of information that we're going to dive into in later series, but in order to even begin right, exploring some of this, you want to keep your personal and your professional life separate. So in order to do that, we create kind of, well, you can consider it a research account, 
Okay. Um, and in, in our, in the open source intelligence community or OSINT community, as I'll refer to it from here on out, we call them sock puppets. And if you think back, if you're old enough to remember lamb chop and Sherry, uh, you know, uh, or any other, I guess, sock puppet or puppet that's out there, it's basically just an alternate identity that you control, but it's completely disconnected from your personal self or anything that is known. And there's some steps that we have to do to kind of create that clean digital footprint for ourselves. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. So we have, uh, we know it's in two, at least objectives here, 1.5, 1.8. If I was going to drill down, because I always like to give you the most pertinent objective. If I was going to drill down into which one it's probably more pertinent to uh, tonight, it would be the one in and, uh, passive and active reconnaissance. And we can frame... Um, OSINT in the same way as passive and active reconnaissance. So we can talk about passive OSINT, which means that you're not going to engage with a target directly, right? Um, you might join the same communities as them, keep a watch, you know, that kind of stuff, but you're going to be more of blending into a group rather than being a part of it. Whereas active, um, OSINT would mean, you know, you're engaging with a target in some uh, form or fashion. You're adding them as a Facebook friend. Uh, you're getting in blending somehow into their target group uh, for active research. And so um, it blend, it, I should say it molds perfectly in this context with passive and active reconnaissance. Now, before we actually get talking about creating a sock puppet, because we're gonna have to come up with a persona for it, right? We got to kind of figure out who we want the sock puppet to be. I want you to take note of this GIF, or excuse me, this graphic. Um, it is basically dividing, and it's probably old these days because this changes so much, but it's dividing a bunch of different, if you were on the internet prior to social media as we know it, say 2008 or whatever, there was all these, this great amalgamation of different communities that were drilled down to, into these very finite topics and everything was done on V bulletin forums and stuff. And it was just really cool. Social media kind of killed all that. And, but we're starting to see it come back, bounce back a little bit. And these smaller social medias that are dedicated to more finite topics are, are starting to become more popular. So as you either investigate your target or create your persona, take note of some of these. So just let's say, for instance, uh, let's say your persona or your target um, likes to blog. You know, they like to blog. Well, these days where there's not just WordPress or Tumblr or Twitter, which are probably, you know, your most popular ones, but there's also TypePad and Weibo or Weebie, excuse me, and Ello and LiveJournal and Medium. And it's possible that your persona may want to join some of these to help strengthen your sock puppet account, right? To help it make it look like a normal sock puppet account. And it's also po uh, possible that your target might actually be in these smaller ancillary communities that are, be, are worthy of investigating. And so, you know, I, I bring this up because we have a tendency a lot to only concentrate on the big ones, right? If we're talking about travel and hospitality, right? Oh, it must just be, uh, you know, Airbnb comes to most people's mind. But there's also VRBO and home exchange and crowd surfing. And so there's, there's possible alternate sources of information out there for a lot of social media. And I think this graph or this graphic um, actually illustrates that pretty well. I'm going to share all these links after this in the Discord chat off to your right. Um, but I just wanted to kind of present this for you because this kind of gives you an, an idea of the scope of how deep social media can run from your larger communities all the way down to your smaller ones. And um, there's a lot of data that could possibly be had there for you, either for your, again, your persona, your sock puppet account, or for the target of your OSINT investigation. Okay, so step one, we want to kind of create a persona. This is one that's really going to be dependent on what the task at hand is. Right. If you want to just become someone else, well, then you can pick up pretty much any persona. If you're, um, you know, targeting a political candidate, doing OSINT on, on a political candidate for a campaign or something like that, or you're doing OSINT on a potential candidate for uh, uh, an employer, right? Maybe you're working in HR and you're trying to, you know, do a deep background check on that. Um, you might change the persona of that account to match, right? Someone in HR might be more interested in like Six Sigma stuff or change management specialty stuff or PCI DSS stuff rather than pure pen testing, right? Um, so ex examples like that, it, it kind of flesh out your own persona. The only thing I can give you as a tip to really help with fleshing out that persona is to just think of what your end goal is and go backwards from there. 
if you can think of your end goal, I want to be able to access this kind of information on this person, or I want to be able to um, freely search this kind of social media, whatever it is, then gear that character, that persona towards that. Now, some way, something that may help you here is fake name generator. This is going to help you kind of, it helps you maybe before and also after, I guess, the whole persona creation process. But fake name generator is great because no matter, I can come in here and I can select different types, male, female, uh, American, all sorts of different, you know, uh, back name, or excuse me, last names and ethnicities, uh, regions to come from, and then uh, individually the country as well, and just generate as many as I want. Let's say I want to do a male. And uh, it will generate not only a you know a name with a somewhat valid address, uh, but possible a fake social security number here, a phone. And again, these aren't going to flesh out, but these are just details for you to put in your profile, right? Um, here, you know, birthday and how old they are exactly. You know, even fake emails if you want, uh, even fake credit card numbers, all sorts of stuff here. Uh, fake physical characteristics, you know, uh, UPS tracking number if you need it, type of car they drive, all sorts of cool stuff. So you can just generate until you find one that either maybe inspires you, uh, or you know, kind of fits the already decided on persona you have for your sock puppet account. Um, we don't really need one for this particular thing, but just, you know, play with this sometime. It is a lot of fun. Now, once you get to this point, you have a pretty good idea of your persona of your sock puppet account or the, you know, the, the, the sock puppet account that's either going to be your alternate persona or going to be used in an OSINT investigation. Um, the next step would be, obviously we need some sort of photos, right? Uh, and a good way to find a profile photo is, um, you know, AI these days, really, really good. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are really good. This person does not exist.com. I personally feel does, uh, one of the best jobs. However, there are some issues here that I'm hoping it's going to generate and we can point out. If you're a lady, you might've already noticed that, uh, two different earrings going on here, right? So it, it, seems that this person does not exist has a real issue with ears <laughs> uh, if we regenerate um, uh, another one that probably proved me right and also sometimes the um, I don't know what the f I forgot what the photography term with, uh, for this is but the the light that's actually flashing um, won't often match up it, it does really well here right it looks like uh, almost similar in the, in both eyes so they did a, the AI did a really good job here, um, but oftentimes that's a problem. Let's see if we can refresh and get another one here. Um, so every time you refresh again, it's gonna be a different person, different age, that kind of thing. But I wanna get some examples here of, to show you some examples of things that could be kind of dead giveaways of poor pictures. Uh, this one's kind of hard to tell. Again, well, it looks like she had a different earring on over there for a sec. Oh, this one's actually not bad with the earrings. I mean, they don't really match up, um, but, and the glasses are weird. You can see that there's no, uh, no frame over here. So if you look on this side, she's missing the actual frame, uh, the earpiece frame where over here it's here. Um, so again, AI helps out a lot. It does a really good job with creating the, you know, your initial profile photo, but Again, some of them are just going to look more natural than others, and you want to kind of pick one that is going to look as natural as possible, especially if people could be possibly looking at it. So this is a decent one here. It's symmetrical. There is a good background. Um, it looks like kind of something you would expect in a, prote a professional, excuse me, photo uh, a uh, professional photograph with like the aperture turned down real low. So it, it blurs out everything else here. Uh, her eyes are pretty much symmetrical, which is usually a dead giveaway. And we can see that the flash is almost, you know, the, or the AI's, uh, you know, interpretation of the flash of the photo is almost perfect there. So, you know, this is again, a, a good one to use. Um, but just be careful when using them. And also it has a real problem. If there's two people in a photo, it will make some uh, hideous mutants of, out of people. Let's see if we can find one. But um, the main point here is just be real careful when choosing one, especially if it's going to be something that's going to be looked at quite often because there are discernible photos e or discernible features that we can very you know, easily tell that uh, that photo is too good. Or, uh, you know, like here she has a hoop earring on, I believe. Or I don't know. See, it's even hard to tell. It looks like a little... And then no earring over here. But anyways, uh, what you can do too, if you have image editing skills, if you have photography editing skills, if you have a lot of day, a lot of times these days, there's a lot of mobile apps that have a lot of features built into it. Um, you can edit these photos, you know, cut them out, change backgrounds, do whatever you want to make it more lifelike. If you find a, 
uh, image that you feel really fits your persona. And if you don't, if you don't have access to like Photoshop or one of the professional tools that are out there, I strongly recommend checking out GIMP. Uh, GIMP is a great um, GNU image manipulation program. It's basically like almost an open source Photoshop. It's very robust. There's tutorials built in on the website. Not going to be all bells and whistles like... Um, like Photoshop, you know, and like the newest version of Photoshop beta has like AI generation built in. You're not going to get that with GIMP, but you're going to be able to edit and manipulate images um, for your purposes just fine. And it's completely free. And again, uh, with open with large open source communities, we can expect that there's going to be a robust support system there because there's a lot of users contributing to the project. And something like GIMP has been around for, I don't know, maybe 30 years now. I'm getting old. So I have a 1996. So yeah, I'm doing you know, 27 years now. So it has a very large user base and you can use something like GIMP um, to help edit your persona photo. Okay, so at this point, let's say we've got our persona picked out. We've got all of our information generated from uh, ran or fake name generator. We've you know found a good name that fits an address, all that stuff for where, what we want. Um, we've edited the photo, it looks well, whatever it may be. Now we need to start you know, there's financial elements that need to come into play here, right? We're going to need a phone, all right, at the very least, because every social media out there these days practically wants a phone. We're going to probably need like a Google account. We're going to need a lot of different things. So the smart, we, we need to figure out the smart way to set it up. And number one for me is I love privacy.com. I don't know if anybody uses this. Uh, for themselves, but privacy.com, I use it personally, is a great place. Uh, you sign up and you connect your bank accounts completely safe and FDIC insured and all that stuff, but you can just spin up your own virtual cards uh, in an instant. And I know Apple Pay has some similar features to this. I'm not sure if it beats it, whatever, but as an Android user, I love privacy.com because I can go in there and create a um, virtual uh, credit card and I can set it to be a one-time only um, so that, it, uh, you know, up to a certain limit, say I want to buy something for $19 on Amazon, I can set the credit card to be $20 and one time only use. And as soon as it's charged, it, the card gets wiped, it's done. Um, it's no longer usable, or I can set it to only, uh, spend, a, allow a certain amount of spending a month or only spend from a certain company. You can select, Hey, this is my Netflix card. It's only going to play Netflix. And so it, it offers you the ability to spin up multiple different payment methods. Now, a word of advice here. This process still uses KYC or know your customer. That is mandatory for every bank. So it's, you're not going to really be able to get around having to put in your own individual unique information uh, for the checking account stuff. Okay. Um, however, the credit cards will be spun up uniquely each individual time. So I really, really, really like um, privacy.com. Now, next thing you're going to need, and uh, you'll see why here in a minute, is an Amazon burner account. Um, Amazon, you don't want to obviously, again, use your own account. So you're going to set up an Amazon burner account. It does not matter what the name is. It does not matter what the address is because what we're going to do is when we buy what we need to buy for our sock puppet accounts on Amazon, we're going to use the Amazon deliver, uh, what do they call it? Amazon pickup box, excuse me. Uh, and every area, um, typically every area that I've seen in the U.S. has the ability for the Amazon pickup box. And it's great. It's, it's anonymous. You get sent an email or a text with a little code and you select where you want it dropped off. There's typically several in each city. And if not, you can drive to a city that has one. But this eliminates Amazon having any idea what your address is, right? Because again, we want to be as disconnected as possible. Now, you might be like, well, Steve, what am I going to be buying on Amazon? Well, we're gonna need a burner phone, right? I typically like to recommend something like this. A nice, cheap phone, again, $40 is relatively inexpensive. You can find cheaper if you want, but what attracted me to this model, besides obviously it has to be unlocked, we don't wanna sign up for any specific carrier, and you'll see why here in a minute. Um, but what attracted to me this is not only is it dual SIM, but it's also an international uh, unlocked version. And dual SIM basically means that we'll have the ability to either use this phone as two separate numbers at once, or you know, as two separate times before we actually have to, you know, or decide we need to get rid of the phone to burn the phone. Um, and so that kind of, you know, ends up saving us money. We we technically get two different IMEI numbers to connect our SIM cards uh, to, and um, you know, so you can look at it as twenty dollars a phone. We don't need it for any fancy features, anything like that if you can find something that's cheaper um 
that that's fine. Uh, that works for you. Just keep in mind, a lot of the cheaper ones are 3G or 2G. <laughs> and I don't know if you can even find 2G services here in the United States or I should say North America. So just make sure, because I did see some cooler, smaller ones when I was doing this. Um, just make sure that you're actually picking up ones that work with a carrier. And the carrier that I'm going to suggest is Mint Mobile. I love Mint Mobile for, I've been using it personally for several years, but as a as a burner phone, as a sock puppet account, it is perfect because Mint Mobile uh, has these wonderful free trial sims that they charge you 99 cents for on Amazon. And this will come in just a couple days or, you know, uh, obviously because you won't be signing up for Prime unless they give you a free trial, I suppose. Um, but this SIM card, and again, it comes, no matter the phone, it comes with the type of SIM you need. It has the standard micro and nano. You just pull off the plastic just like your normal uh, SIM cards. But this SIM card is going to give you I believe it was, yeah, trial plan with 250 megabytes of 5G or 4G LTE data. We won't really need too much of that. 250 text messages. We will be using some text messages for 2FA, right? Multi-factor authentication when we sign up for our social medias. And 250 minutes of talk, we shouldn't need any of that. And it's all good for seven days. So we have seven days essentially where we can, you know, use for 99 cents that phone to set up all of this um you know, all of this back end sock puppet stuff we need, all these social media accounts and, and, and all these things that we need. Um, and, and that really is plenty of time, typically, I've found. If you need more time than that, maybe plan it a little better. Um, one thing I will suggest too is that when you're setting up the Mint Mobile trial and you actually plug it into your GSM phone, uh, into the, your cheap burner phone, and uh, oh yeah, that's one more thing to mention. Excuse me, I'm going off track here, but make sure Mint Mobile is GSM, it's T Mobile, it's. Um, AT&T, I believe, is also GSM. So if you are planning on using a different SIM card, say from Sprint uh, or AT&T, or Sprint, excuse me, or Verizon, which are CDMA, you may want to investigate a different phone because the one I just showed you is GSM only. So just, again, make sure the compatibility is there for all of your components. Now, um, one thing I will suggest is that you set up your Mint Mobile trial account on that phone far from your home. From your actual home as far as you're willing to go um, when I know this sounds really silly but typically I plan stuff like this when I'm out of the city on vacation or uh, at a seminar or something like that I'll spend a few minutes in the hotel and setting it up from there and that'll be where my sock puppet typically comes from um, you just don't want to connect anywhere you don't want to have any sort of connection there between your home and your sock puppet accounts right because you want all these you just don't want any of those social signals to be picked up from in the social media uh, systems now after you have your Mint Mobile set up, let me go ahead and delete that, excuse me. Uh, after you have your Mint Mobile set up, you can get a VPN if you'd like. Typically what I've found is it's a mixed bag. What I've found that works best for me is not using a VPN uh, on the initial sign up process for a social media account, simply because a lot of them detect that and flag your account right away. I've noticed that happens. So what I typically like to do is I'll just go somewhere where there's free Wi-Fi. And every time I go to use that sock puppet account, or especially if I'm doing it through that phone, I will only turn it on and only use it at a place, different place each time that has free Wi-Fi as I'm traveling or, you know, again, McDonald's, Panera, wherever it may be. Um, but I typically do that because then it alerts the social media uh, systems that I'm a traveler, right? It allows me to have multiple different IPs that in areas that it recognizes with my account usage and nothing really pops up as suspicious. Um, I do recommend that you set up a Google, uh, account. Okay. And also some sort of secure email. You can use something like 10 minutemail.com, which is a great temporary email. You can get an instant address and it'll, it'll be burned in 10 minutes, but it's great for signing up for social media stuff or for, let's say the social media stuff you're not going to interact with as much. However, if there's going to be social media that you need to interact with more and change your settings and things, then I strongly just recommend grabbing something like a Proton Mail account or my personal favorite is Tuta Noda. Uh, tutanota.io is, is a great uh, German secure email uh, facil uh, provider, I should say. Um, so you're going to want to do that. Once you get all that done and set up all your social media accounts, and remember, you know, we have quite a bit, not just the big boys, right? Not just your Facebooks and your Twitters and your TikTokers and those things and your Twitchers and your Spotify's. But hey, if, the, if someone's into music, they might be on Pandora and Hype Machine and Shazam and Groove Shark and Last.fm and SoundCloud and all these other things, YouTube music. Um, so just make sure that you're, you know, you're 
getting all the accounts that you could possibly want to interact with, all the social media accounts that either your target has or your persona is going to need set up right now and set up 2FA on all the accounts. Then 2FA, excuse me, two-factor authentication, right? So some possibly either getting a text to that cell phone or whatever it may be. What I like to personally do for 2FA is after setting up 2FA on all my accounts, I change the phone number and I typically buy a MySudo plan. Uh, my pseudo is great. You can use things like Google Voice, but I, I just like having more flexibility and control like you do with my pseudo. Um, but for 99 cents a month or $10 a year, you can get a phone number, three different email addresses, a couple different handles, uh, you know, secure comms and all that stuff. Uh, and with that pseudo phone number is 100 messages a month and 30 minutes a month, which is more than you'll need for any sort of 2FA interactions that you'll have um, with your sock puppet account. Uh, and you can go deeper if you need to, right? And um, so th this is great. They accept all sorts of different payments, PayPal, crypto, whatever. So you can really re remain anonymous. But once you set up 2FA on all those accounts, I then turn them to be my pseudo uh, phone number or Google Voice uh, phone number. That way I can make sure everything works, first of all, right? I always want to test out all the features and make sure everything works. Uh, but then I can then destroy the SIM card. I typically like to melt mine, burn them in a fire, uh, wipe the phone, both logically and physically, right? So we want to make sure we destroy all data, wipe the phone back, you know, wipe cache space, all that stuff that may be existing depending on the phone and the uh, operating system. Uh, I want to completely revert that phone back to normal. I want to physically wipe all fingerprints off it, and then I just want to get rid of it. At that point, you don't need it. It's done what you've needed it to do. Um, the Any 2FA stuff no longer comes to that phone number. It now comes to your MySudo or your Google Voice number, whatever it may be, and we don't need to interact with that phone or that IMEI at all. Now, that is you know, you may want to keep the phone depending on how covert you're going to be, right? If you just want to play with some sock puppet accounts to get used to it, if you're not actively engaged in investigation, if you just want to do some um, research for your company or your family or whatever it may be, then by all means, keep the phone. I'm talking, you know, being a little more covert, a little more Mission Impossible, which the new one I think is coming out soon and looks good. Um, but I'm talking about being a little more covert there, then you can wipe the phone and destroy it. And at this point, you know, if you followed those steps, you have secure sock puppet accounts that are actively engaged in whatever topic your persona should be or your target should be. And um, they're completely untraceable back to you. So that is how to create a sock puppet account. I'm going to publish this. Um, I have an article. I'm going to publish it on my site. We're also going to uh, drop this recording onto YouTube and to, to the Total Seminar side of things. Um, but yeah, that is creating a sock puppet account for open source intelligence purposes. And that is, I believe it was 1.5 and 1.8 in the CompTIA um, Security Plus objectives.